I'd like to start off, first of all, by uh, just introducing um, Anil. And there's, there's so much uh, that I can say about him that I don't know sort of what to pick and choose. But um, Dr. Gupta has been a, a professor here for uh, many years after um, uh, graduating from uh, uh, prestigious institutions, I, IIM and IIT in India, and, and Harvard Business School here in the United States. And he's uh, widely known as a leading expert on, um, on strategy, on globalization, and also on entrepreneurship. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about some of the, um, the, the awards, I guess, um, or designations that he's received. I guess one which is really unique is he is uh, ranked by a group called Thinkers 50 as one of the world's most influential living management thinkers. Now, I think if we um, included the not living ones, I'm not sure if you'd still be in the top 50, but we'll, uh, we'll give you that one in any case. Um, he's also been named by The Economist as one of the world's um, superstars in a cover story on innovation uh, in emerging economies. And he's one of only three professors out of a total of 25,000 worldwide uh, to have sort of a triple play of being elected as a lifetime fellow of um, the Academy of Management, the Strategic Management Society, and the Academy of International Business, which are uh, very well-known associations in our profession. Uh, Anil has also been very prolific um, as a writer, both in academic journals as well as writing books. And I have uh, a, a small assortment of these books here with me. Uh, the one, uh, not, the fir not his first book, but one that received uh, really great attention a few years back. Uh, with a very modest um, title of The Quest for Global Dominance. <laughs> okay. Um, the uh, one that was published, I guess, about five years ago or so, which uh, really dug into uh, China and India, which will be predominantly what we'll talk about here today, called Getting China and India Right. And uh, the most recent one, which uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to also discuss, is called the Silk Road Rediscovered, which is about uh, connections between China and India uh, specifically. Um, Anil has also served as a columnist, uh, serves as a columnist for Bloomberg Business Week. Um, is a contributing editor for Chief Executive Magazine. He has served uh, and does serve on numerous um, boards of public companies. Um, and the list really goes on and on. And so I'm going to end it there by just saying he's a very distinguished scholar with a very, very broad visibility in our uh, profession and um, in its influence on uh, corporate America and, and globally. So with that said, I want to um, start off with a few questions about Asia. And um, I'd like to offer a lot of time for you all to ask questions as well so that we can make this really um, as um, participative as possible. So. Uh, one of the, as I guess an opening remark um, that, that you often note uh, when we discuss this topic, that uh, now Asia represents about a, a third of the global GDP, and, and within the next t 10 years or so, uh, will sort of overtake uh, North America and Europe combined in terms of its GDP. So clearly there are huge opportunities in Asia, both in terms of um, our ability to sell into those countries, um, the manufacturing and R&D power of those companies, increasingly the capital that they all have to be able to invest here and, and globally, and we're seeing all the impacts of all that. So I thought maybe we'd start off by talking about the opportunities, and then we could talk about the risks involved and some of the more recent um, things that we're starting to see. So from your perspective, I guess, uh, looking at U.S. corporations in particular, how do you sort of view in terms of getting India and China right and global dominance, how do you view strategy from how do I go and get Asia right? Right, yeah. And so, I mean, you know, for U.S. corporations, um, uh, the, uh, the and, and again, you know, what I would say for companies, uh, what's uh, the right Asia strategy for companies may be different from what is the right Asia strategy for countries, you know in terms of, let's say, you know, the U.S. pivot to Asia and things like that, you know, because those are uh, uh, in some ways quite different issues. But for companies, I would say, is to really think of uh, whether it's an IBM, a PNG, a Siemens, a GE, uh, to look at Asia strategy as really a sigma of multiple strategies. 
And multiple here, I'm thinking first, not so much as a China strategy and India strategy and so on, et cetera, but I'm thinking about really that Asia represents many things uh, to multinationals. It represents a market. So if you look at already, you know, as a region, as a continent, Asia is about 34, 35% of the world's GDP. And GDP, that's at market exchange rates, and that's a good indicator of the size of market you know, uh, for lots of things. Uh, so, and uh, Asia is the fastest growing region in the world. So it's, you know, it's growing at about 5% a year uh, in real terms, uh, you know, which compares to, let's say, about 2.5%, 3% for the U.S. and essentially zero uh, for Europe. Uh, and so Asia represents the largest market and the fastest growing market. So that's number one. Number two, is that for corporations, and that's something which political leaders may not necessarily be comfortable with, but for corporations, uh, Asia represents also the world's factory. Uh, because corporations, in a sense, are agnostic about where they manufacture from a nationality point of view. What they really care about is the most efficient place to manufacture, number one. But efficiency is both about labor cost and other costs, but it's also about being close to customers, shorter supply chains. And so if Asia is becoming the world's number one market, it makes sense to be producing in Asia and selling in Asia rather than exporting from here, unless we are talking about high value items like aircraft you know, or ships and things like that. Uh, so Asia is uh, you know, as, as a place for companies to become super efficient in terms of their global cost structure. Number three is that Asia uh, represents increasingly uh, the emerging R&D hub uh, for multinationals. So if you look at uh, companies like Microsoft, and we say outside the US, uh, where are two of their biggest R&D centers? Uh, you know, it's Beijing and Bangalore. Uh, you look at IBM, you look at Google, uh, Facebook, uh, Texas Instruments. A GE, you know, a GE has a 5,000 person R&D center in Bangalore, which in terms of the number of scientists and engineers is the largest in the world, even bigger than the one that they have, you know, the one that Thomas Edison uh, created. Uh, and so, so Asia is a market, Asia is, a, you know, location for manufacturing, Asia is a place for R&D, uh, Asia is a source of low cost capital. Uh, so that's number four. And of course, on the opposing side, uh, Asia is where some of the new competitors for multinationals are emerging. You know? And whether that's an Alibaba from China, uh, or a Tata Motors from India, or Infosys, or Wipro, uh, companies like that. Uh, and so Asia, and actually, you know, these uh, separate, you know, what I like to say, stories, uh, that they are in some sense correlated, but not highly. You know? And so essentially, for a GE, they need, when they think about Asia from a strategy point of view, they need to think about what's my market strategy for Asia, which is different from what my manufacturing strategy, or what is the role of Asia in my global manufacturing strategy? What's the role of Asia in my global R&D strategy in terms of sourcing capital? And of course, how do I deal with the emerging competitors? So we have to break up the, the elements of the strategy. That, that um, is a very good and clear point. Um, and also disaggregate Asia yeah. uh, into the various countries. So maybe you could talk a little bit about uh, some specific trends, um, most notably, I guess, China, India, maybe Indonesia yeah. as well, so that we kind of get a sense for where you see the emerging opportunities. That's right. So when I, uh, Alex, when I think of Asia geographically, so I kind of uh, look at it as sub-regions. Uh, so one is, uh, we could say, North Asia. That's really actually Japan and uh, South Korea. Uh, you know, that's developed, high-tech, globally very strong in terms of the companies, you know, the Samsungs and the Toyotas and so on, et cetera. Then you have Greater China, which is, of course, PRC and Hong Kong and Taiwan and Macau and so on, et cetera. So that's Greater China. Then you have India, you have Southeast Asia, and then of course there is West Asia. So of these, the uh, you know the the Japan, 
uh, Hong Kong, well, I mean, for the moment I forget Hong Kong, we are included that as part of Greater China, but Japan, South Korea, Singapore, Australia, New Zealand, those are the rich economies. But then if you leave the rich economies, and they are you know, almost by definition just like rich economies everywhere, is that they are slow growth. Uh, Australia is suffering from serious doldrums right now. Again, you know, the end of the commodity uh, boom, uh, and, and Japan is in trouble. South Korea is doing well. So really, where is the growth in Asia? The growth in Asia is really the three big emerging regions. That's greater China, or China, that's India, and that's Southeast Asia. Uh, and these are three actually quite different, uh, because you know, China is now, of course, the center of Asian economy. It's about you know, 35, 36% of Asia's GDP. Uh, the, uh, uh, and uh, China is uh, uh, you know, now a seriously middle-income country with about $7,000, $7,500 per capita income. Uh, but China, the, the, the challenge for China is that it is slowing down. Uh, and it is slowing down uh, rather rapidly. Uh, official GDP growth rate for uh, 2014, you know, it's sort of around low 7% kind of range. But many economists say that maybe, yeah, you know, it's kind of the figures are massaged a little bit, uh, and that the actual numbers could even be closer to five, five and a half uh, percent. Uh, India is a much poorer economy than China uh, in per capita terms, in terms of size of overall GDP. It's about a quarter uh, that of China. Uh, but at the same time, because it's starting from a lower base, uh, and it started opening up and reforming the economy in 1991 as compared to China in 1978, uh, that India is now beginning to pick up steam, uh, or so it seems. Uh, and it's uh, quite likely that 2015, it, China, India may grow faster than China. Southeast Asia uh, is now actually, per capita income-wise, uh, you have variations, but you know Malaysia is more like $10,000, $12,000 per capita income. Of course, Singapore is very, you know, seriously rich. Uh, the Thailand is middle income, Vietnam is relatively poor, but overall, Southeast Asia, uh, so if India's per capita income is about 2,500, China's is about 7,500, uh, Southeast Asia, ASEAN is more like 5,000, and so on, so it falls in between, and ASEAN is growing at about 5%. But, you know, and that includes, you know, really <coughs> Indonesia, which is half of ASEAN, uh, 40, 45 percent. Uh, so the, so I think the, the, in terms of Asia, the big opportunities are emerging Asia, and emerging Asia, the big opportunities are really in the following sequence, China, India, and uh, Indonesia. So focusing on, on China specifically, um, you talked about the slowdown in growth, and there's a lot of discussion about that. Um, what do you see as sort of the key factors that are slowing that growth? And do you see any sort of more catastrophic risk of a, a really large decline in that growth that could have re large repercussions for the global economy? Right, 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 right. Yeah, I mean, the, so the, the slowdown in China's growth, uh, in part, it's a function of just the stage of economic development. Uh, you know, just like trees don't grow to the sky, and so, uh, you know, given how far China has come from 1980, uh, that it, is, it was bound to slow down, you know. Uh, so that's sort of inevitable, and it has happened to every economy, you know, be that Japan when it was, you know, uh, in an earlier stage of rapid growth or South, or South Korea. Uh, so in that sense, you know, it's nothing surprising. But at the same time, part of it, we could say, is also a result of policy uh, or policies uh, which makes the challenge for China harder. Uh, and so I look at uh, three types of policies. Uh, number one, you know, if you just look at the one-child policy. And so, of course, who knows, you know, because that's the experiment that did not take place, what China's population growth rate would have been if there was no one-child policy. So we don't know that. But we know that there is one-child policy. And so the, the, the effect of one-child policy is that the labor pool in China, and labor pool is the one that creates really economic value, they are the people who work. So that's age group 15 to 64. 
and 15 to 64 age group <clears throat> until about two years back was growing at about half a percent a year. Earlier it was growing at 1% a year. Now, actually, according to all the data that I know, uh, China's labor pool is shrinking by 1% a year. So that's a big drop. Uh, so that's number one. Second is, so and that's a result of policy and cannot be reversed quickly at all. The second one is that the Chinese government, in a very good way, but ultimately even good policies have unintended consequences, in a very good way, really built an economy that's driven by the supply side logic and not demand side logic. Meaning you build infrastructure, you build manufacturing capacity, you keep inflation low, you create employment and you grow the GDP. And so, you know, I mean, so China, for example, the uh, while GDP grew, you know, if we look at average last 30 years, grew at about 10%, uh, actually fixed <coughs> investment, gross fixed capital formation, in real terms, grew at about 13, 14%. So actually consumption declined uh, as a ratio to, <coughs> to GDP, exports grew and investment grew. But now, the, 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 and that's good. You know, I mean, I wish India had done something similar, which it is now uh, starting to do. But the unintended consequence of that is that once you have invested that much in infrastructure, you can't keep investing. Now, even if China keeps investing at the same rate in real terms next five years as it did in the last, oh, last year, but because the previous five years it was ramping up, that, and if the next five years stay steady, still next five years will mean 50% more investment mm -hmm. in infrastructure than the last five years. No, you know, of course, I mean, China still needs to invest a lot more in infrastructure, but the point is, can it continue to increase, you know, uh, investment at the same pace? And it can't. And if so, if, you know, growth in uh, fixed asset investment has contributed about 3 to 4 percent in China's GDP growth, that just goes out of the window, right? So the labor, the pool, you know, that's not growing. You, you know, throw the... Uh, the contribution to GDP growth from fixed asset investment growth, that goes out of the window. Exports are slowing down. So those are, a, you know, a number of factors. It's very hard to see how the government can reverse any of them. So, yeah. Yeah. Given that we, we have the experience with what the Chinese government has done, and we've seen that pattern of growth, um, you mentioned India and kind of what you wish had, had occurred soon, but now we are seeing some, some changes and with the new government, the new Modi government, I'm just curious how you predict the kind of path that we may see in terms of the way that they invest, the way that the government changes certain policies to become pro-business and so on in India. Yeah, uh, and I think, I mean, the, it starts, of course, with the, uh, the, the two starting points would be, number one, what is the ideology of the government in power? And, uh, to simplify a little bit, but not grossly, you know, is the ideology basically of distribution, or is the ideology driven, you know, kind of pro-growth? Uh, and of course, the two are not unconnected. Uh, in the long term, you need both. Uh, otherwise, you know, you have the piggity, you know, the inequalities uh, that uh, can be seriously problematic for any economy, right? But you do need a bias, at least in the short to medium. And the, the government in power since May is a right-wing government. It's a very pro-economic growth government, pro-business government. Uh, so in that sense, I would say, given where India is right now, at least from my perspective, that's the right kind of bias that one would want. The, uh, uh, the second thing is that in a democratic system, uh, if the government is essentially uh, an unwieldy, unstable coalition, then their ability to put into practice or enact policies that might be aligned with the largest party's ideology <coughs> is limited. But the government that came to power has a clear majority, uh, so therefore that is another plus. Of course, it's still, it's a democratic system, 
and uh, certainly uh, as somebody who was kind of, you know, who has the Indian DNA uh, in his uh, veins uh, and, uh, you know, who is a, an American citizen, I couldn't dream uh, of India being uh, any other way. <clears throat> and so, but, but the way I see is that the, in the short term, and the short term might be 30 years, the short term I don't mean two years, uh, is that in terms of fostering <coughs> economic development, a democracy may enact a cost. Because, you know, I mean, if uh, a Chinese uh, governor uh, of a province or a party secretary of a province, you know, wants to build a highway from this city to that city, basically you can look at the map, draw a straight line. <coughs> And if there are some villages on the way, that's just a minor implementation problem, okay? Uh, not so in India. Uh, and so therefore, it's going to slow down. Uh, uh, and people ask all kind of questions, and sometimes those questions may be stupid, but if they ask them, you know, you can't ignore them, right? Uh, and so, but, you know, so therefore, China grew at 10%, and maybe it's not that easy for India to grow at 10 uh, but. You know, but the cost of democracy, even in, on a 30-year time frame, is only about 1 or 2 percent of GDP. So can India grow at 8 to 9? Yeah, you know, given its democratic system. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, now over a 60-year time frame, which is better, uh, even from an economic growth point of view, uh, there one could have a nice debate. Because China, the command and control system, was very helpful in getting China to where it is. But today, China needs to innovate. And that system itself is proving to be a serious handicap. China spends about nine times of India on R&D as a country, private, public sector, defense, all combined. But by many measures of solid, solid measures of R&D output, India is about half that of China. So the productivity of R&D investment in China is pitifully small as compared to India. The only explanation I can give you know, are the systems. So therefore, 30 years from now, when innovation really becomes the game on which China and India have to compete, India may do a heck of a lot better than China. That's a very interesting perspective. Well, why don't, instead of um, me dominating with all the questions here, I wanted to open it up. I have plenty of other questions if you don't. but. Uh, you may well have some, so does anybody want to ask uh, Professor Gupta any questions directly? Feel free to disagree with <laughs> anything. Um, yes. Please. Um, Professor Gupta, thank you for doing this. Welcome, um, pleasure. So you were talking about how India's democracy can be, can even with democracy, India can grow about 8 to 9 percent. Where do you think India's corruption plays into this? Uh, I mean, corruption is a serious problem for any country. Uh, the other thing, of course, is that, uh, you know, China and India have been uh, and are today the two fastest growing economies in the world. Uh, and they also, unfortunately, happen to be two of the most corrupt economies in the world. Uh, so therefore, uh, you know, would they have done even better without corruption? Maybe. But corruption, while it's a, you know, kind of a black mark, massive black mark on each of these two societies, hasn't actually been a serious handicap. And part of the, you know, kind of my analysis of corruption is a little bit like this, uh, that it's something which there is simply no way to root it out quickly. And, and, and the reason why I say is this, you know, imagine in a very simplified form, an xy graph. So on the y you have time, and on the x-axis you have the role of the state versus the market. And I assume the total is 100, so we are dividing 100 units into ro role of the state in the economy versus role of the market. The reason why China and India were both basket cases 20, 30 years back is because the role of the state was essentially dominant. 100, 0 in China, maybe 80, 20 in India, right? And so then the economy goes nowhere because they are no entrepreneurs and they don't have the incentives. So of course, you know, the leaders, they see the light and they want economic growth. And so they began to relax the rule of the state. That's what we mean by reform, right? Deng Xiaoping in China, Narsim Rao in India. So as they start the reform process, the market begins to take over from the state. 
more and more of the functioning, functioning of the economy is by the logic of the market. So now, of course, you cannot go from state to market in one day. Because when you do that, you create the oligarchs as in Russia. So it has to be more like a, you know, a process over time. Let's assume hypothetically that we are at 50-50 right now. Now, when you are at 50-50, so now the market has a huge big role. And that's why we have seen the economic growth. But you see, the state is still 50%. So you have politicians and you have bureaucrats. And they get the salaries officially of the politicians and bureaucrats. But now that they relax the policies, so now you create the billionaires and the millionaires. And now the bureaucrat is sitting on this side of the table, and the billionaire is sitting on the other side of the table. And the bureaucrat is saying, my god, am I stupid? OK, you see the problem, right? So how do you fix it? There is no way. You can't go from state to market in one day. So you have to do it over 30, 40, 50 years. And if you do it gradually, you will have the politicians and bureaucrats on official low salaries. So therefore, structural conditions for high corruption are very strong. Doesn't mean anybody has to accept it. But at the same time, you know, you, you, you can't say, you know, this is an aberration. It's not an aberration. This is true of every emerging economy in the world today, whether it's Indonesia, or Nigeria, or Turkey, or what have you, right? I mean, it's a good thing that Xi Jinping is kind of pushing very hard uh, to address corruption, uh, that Modi is pushing very hard to address corruption. So it's a good thing, uh, but you know, it's not going to be easy. Yes. Um, my name is Bruce, and I'm a first year MBA. Thanks for talking with us. Um, I think in the last quarter, China said they had like a ninety billion dollar capital outflow. Um, so my question is, what do you? By think that you mean FDI, uh, outbound FDI, or outbound? Uh, I think it's like a capital. Oh, outflow. capital outflow. Yeah, FDI. FDI is for the year. That's hundred twenty-five. Yeah. You're right. Um, yeah. So with that much money coming out of China in a quarter, uh, I guess, what do you think is really being done with it, and how does it affect um, the U.S., and is there any uh, changes to the global um, economy that you see from, from that much money moving around? I think the, the 90 billion that's coming out, the my assessment would be that a good chunk would be just Chinese citizens wanting to get the money out of China. Because, see, if you look at, and that's because that you said for one quarter, right? Now, if you look at what are the various ways in which money comes out of a country. So money comes out of the country in terms of outbound FDI. Outbound FDI from China is about 110 billion or so for the whole of last year. Uh, slightly more than inbound FDI of 105 billion or so, or, or maybe 105, 110, and so on. So basically, FDI net outbound inbound balances out. When we are talking about, yeah, so there is part of it is certainly China still run, runs a trade surplus. And so trade surplus uh, would typically, uh, no, trade surplus would actually mean money coming in rather than money going out. Right? So it's trade deficit is, that would lead to capital outflow. So trade surplus would not explain it, right? Uh, outbound F or FDI net would not explain it. So what would explain 90 billion in one quarter, right? So it really, it's hard to see it's a policy driven or national kind of, you know, figures driven. Uh, so it's uh, probably, some seriously, at least a good chunk of it, some seriously wealthy Chinese who are not comfortable keeping the money in China. Now, what does it mean for the global economy? Probably not a whole lot, uh, in the sense that you know China's foreign exchange reserves are more like around four trillion or so, and so 90 billion out of four trillion is not a huge big figure, you know. And if you look at uh, just you know holding of uh, U.S. T bills about two trillion and so on, so the numbers that we are relatively speaking small, uh, either in the context of China, or in the context of China, U.S., or in the context of global capital flows. 
to so build. I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Bruce. So I mean, I've just basically heard, um, and with no real scientific evidence, that a lot of the money is going to like American real estate, and people are just buying a lot of buildings um, sure. in the U.S., and I'm just wondering if that's anything that you heard about, or it's, is it trending on a real estate market, um, or is it just not enough money to make an impact? See, no, I mean, Clearly, you're right. I mean, you know, that uh, Chinese money is uh, being invested in real estate in the U.S., in the U.K., at least uh, those two places. Uh, but, you know, all of that is counted as FDI. And so, so when we say China outbound FDI about 110 billion, inbound FDI about 110 billion, or, you know, kind of give and take 5 billion here or there, but roughly speaking, they match up for last year. So then actually it shouldn't make an effect, right? Just to kind of build on that point, on Bruce's point, um, in terms of the emergence of Chinese-based multinational corporations, right. how, how do you see those kind of, that, that kind of emergence of MNCs coming out of China? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I, I, I think I would say that uh, the Chinese MNCs, and here, uh, Alex, and I assume you, you obviously don't mean Chinese exporters, because those have existed right. for the last 30 years, but it's really investment. Right? Investment, sort of a broad Absolutely. network across the globe. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so in investments, I would put it into two different, maybe three different, but first two and then a second one into 2A, 2B. Uh, so one is the state-owned enterprises. Uh, most of them are in actually really the resource sectors, uh, and you know oil and you know steel and so the you know it's for, therefore mining and things like that, etc. Chenalco, uh, you know Aluminum Corporation of China, uh, and, and 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 the like, <coughs> and so uh, and the so it's Chinese state-owned enterprises investing in you know natural resources whether that's in Nigeria or in Angola or in South Sudan or Australia or elsewhere. So that's one type. And actually, if you look at the total stock of China's outbound FDI, uh, and of course in FDI it's the stock that's more important than annual flow. Uh, on the stock of outbound FDI, about 70% is actually investment in natural resources. The 30%, which is of relatively more recent, uh, you know, timing, uh, is typically the private sector, and or some arms of the state sector. So, like uh, 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 Bright Foods, which uh, actually is a state-owned enterprise in the food sector. So they bought an Israeli yogurt company. They bought a British cereal company, and they bought an Australian meat company. Uh, so companies like that, or you have uh, acquisitions uh, in the, like by Wangshan Group, which is an auto parts company in the U.S. and Australia, uh, or you have more recent, you know, acquisitions in the technology sector uh, and so on. Those are typically by private sector companies, uh, or you have like Alibaba Group, uh, which uh, just plunked down half a billion dollars in an Indian e-commerce startup. Uh, so again, you know, so 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 those are more recent, uh, of more recent uh, uh, timing. Uh, I would hope that as the story plays out, uh, it's the latter type uh, that would be more prominent, uh, because the investment in natural resources, my analysis, uh, all along has been. You know, kind of some people in China would say, oh, you know, this is to kind of corner or control uh, access to natural resources. And I thought that was complete hogwash uh, because, you know, I concluded that the, notwithstanding the size of China's economy, uh, that the need for iron ore and oil, etc., was still a tiny percent of the global supply, annual supply of iron ore or you know, oil or gas, forget about the reserves. And so there was no way, you know, it's like trying to, to buy up the ocean. Uh, you can't. Uh, and so the reason why uh, Chinese state-owned enterprise were making investments in Brazil or Australia or Africa were not because they needed to, but because being state-owned enterprises, 
Uh, they had access to low-cost capital, <coughs> monopoly positions in many industries, massive cash flow, which is burning a hole in the pocket. You need to do something with it. So tre U.S. Treasury bonds are no longer <laughs> the only thing. Um, <laughs> yes, there's a question back there. Your last question about environmental impact. What role do you see in potential limits or constraints on carbon emissions and fossil fuels and emissions, especially with comparison? on the expansion, especially of the Asian. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, China and India, again, as uh, large economies, large populations, uh, <coughs> rapid growth, uh, and so on, that they are no, you know, surprise, uh, are two of the, the biggest emitters of, uh, you know, carbon dioxide and other, uh, you know, uh, gases, uh, you know, greenhouse creators. Uh, so uh, that's a big problem. The uh, China, uh, and of course, you know, there's been longer debate between uh, China and India on the one side and the rich countries on the other about, you know, so whose responsibility is it, right? If you look at annual output, of course, China and India are the ones putting it up, you know, in the air. But ultimately, they say, look, what matters is the total accumulation uh, in the atmosphere and not the annual output. Who put it there over the last hundred years, right? Uh, and so the, the China and India say to the West, you pay us, you know, to clean our economy. And the, the West says, we have no money, you know, and you are the one who, you see the, so essentially, you know, this debate essentially has no answer, right? Or no solution to it, uh, unless one side gives in or they compromise. So, you know, so it's continued to be essentially a stalemate until uh, now, if you look at over the last 12 months, that the pollution in China has become so bad uh, that it's not the international community, but it's the Chinese citizens who will not put up with it anymore. And survey after survey after survey says that for Chinese citizens, uh, pollution, environmental degradation is the number one uh, concern ahead of pollution or ahead of uh, corruption, ahead of uh, economic growth. And so therefore, the internal demands have, so China has now agreed uh, to, yeah, that, that's right, you know, it is agreeing to, to binding agreement, you know, uh, targets and all of that. India is still kind of uh, recalcitrant uh, in, uh, on the environmental front, uh, and the Indian government is saying, uh, you know, we we need to grow. I mean, China did it for the last 30 years and so on. But I think, uh, you know, I mean, Delhi is supposedly even more polluted, the Delhi air, than Beijing. Uh, and so, so therefore, you know, will Indian citizens put up with it? Uh, that's number one. Number two is that obviously India needs to grow. Uh, and here, I don't fully know the answer. Uh, but uh, I do know from uh, looking at companies or working with some companies that technologies are advancing so rapidly uh, that essentially closed cycle factories, you know, where, you know, uh, you don't, you know, you recycle uh, the chemicals in the air or chemicals in the water and what comes out is basically steam or, uh, you know, uh, clean water. Uh, and you reuse, uh, and so therefore, you know, so is it becoming cost effective? Uh, I hope so, I don't know. One thing I do know that among the, uh, you know, of course, pollution, air and water uh, takes place in many, many, many ways. Uh, one of the biggest polluters are autos, uh, right? And of course, electric utilities. You look at all, all the coal-fired plants in China and in India and so on, et cetera. Uh, is that uh, India, Indian government right now has the most aggressive in the world uh, solar energy uh, uh, plan. So currently it produces about three gigawatts of solar energy. Uh, the, the plan is to have 100 gigawatts uh, by 2022. Uh, and a good chunk of that order may go to Chinese solar panel manufacturers. Uh, uh, but, you know, as if the Indian government in fact, is successful in implementing that plan, that would be the right kind of development, you know, that one would hope to see. Or 
Uh, is there any correlation between GDP and per capita income? As India's GDP is rising, is it impacting per capita? Yeah, in, in the sense that per capita income is just GDP divided by population. So, you know, other than population growth rate, GDP flows straight into per capita income calculations. But in terms of the distribution, I guess, is, is are we starting to see a more and more skewed distribution? Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I mean, the, the distribution is, uh, it's exceptionally skewed in China's case. Uh, it is skewed in India's case, but less so. Uh, than in China's case, so which means that, and of course, you know, among the BRICS, uh, oh, you can imagine the worst is Russia, right? Uh, and I was, you know, looking at a figure because normally, if you look at IMF, World Bank, you know, uh, these data sources, uh, they give data on the average per capita income, but they don't give data on the median per capita income. And looking at the comparison between median and average, you know, it's that's one way to get a, a quick, uh, you know, rough and dirty sense for the inequality in society. I read this uh, just about a week back in uh, Financial Times, and it was shocking. Uh, so I have to double check because it was uh, a little bit too shocking a number because Russia's per capita income is ten thousand dollars U.S. dollars. The article said that Russia's median per capita income is eight hundred and forty dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now think about that. <laughs> okay. So the skewness happens um, for at least a couple reasons. One is corruption. You've already talked yeah. about that, so we won't go back to that. The other one is entrepreneurship that you yeah. um, referenced earlier and, and is an exciting part of the growth that we're seeing there. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about differences that you're seeing in entrepreneurship in India and China also relative to the experience here in the U.S. You talked a little bit about politics, but what about, what about culture um, and other elements that drive entrepreneurship? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think, uh, uh, you know, just like, I mean, if you look at the uh, U.S. as, uh, you know, as kind of the beacon of entrepreneurship in the world and uh, continues to be so, well, you know, there's no place in the world that is even close to Silicon Valley even today, right? And so, so if you look at uh, the, you know, so it's a, it's a number of things. Uh, it's culture, it's policies, uh, uh, you know, but if you look at culture uh, in the U.S., the, uh, you know, Silicon Valley is, uh, uh, you know, the, the figures are that over the last uh, 10 years, 15 years, about 60% of the tech venture or ventures founded in Silicon Valley uh, uh, had a founder, co-founder uh, who was born outside the U.S., okay? And so, you know, you just go to Silicon Valley and you look at the top leaderships of companies or increasingly now venture <coughs> capital firms, you know, you see Chinese names and Indian names and Israeli names and French names and the like, right? And so, and, and I think, uh, of course, you know, and what that does is uh, two things. So number one is that diversity by itself uh, uh, fosters innovation because, uh, uh, you know, and diverse, you know, because innovation is often seen as novel combination of existing ideas. And so people with different lenses, mindsets, uh, uh, they, 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 they bring different uh, perspectives and that's, you know, is good for innovation. So that's first. The second thing about being open to migration or uh, immigration uh, is that, you know, uh, and again, uh, not trying to be self-serving, but on average, the immigrant is a bit of an outlier in his or her society. You know, at least chose to uproot himself or herself and move to another country and make that country his or her home, okay? And so you're already, quote-unquote, an explorer. You're comfortable with doing something Maybe could we say you are a little bit more entrepreneurial than otherwise, perhaps. Uh, and so being open to immigration, I think it's, it's, it's good. Now, of course, you don't see too many immigrants in either China or India. Uh, but India, 
uh, in that sense has a little bit of an advantage uh, over China because uh, it's uh, the most diverse country in the world, ethnically, in terms of religion, in terms of language, uh, and so on. So, you know, you have people in the north, you know, who look as fair as, you know, a white American. Uh, and you have people in uh, the south, you know, who are, could be as dark uh, as somebody from Africa. Uh, and, you know, it's just a big country, whereas China is, what, 88, 90 percent Han, uh, you know. So, of course, the Chinese government, you know, made Mandarin the national language. Uh, in India, Hindi is the national language officially but not really on the ground. Uh, so, 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 the, uh, so, 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 so the diversity, I think, is a plus for India. Uh, another plus uh, from a policy point of view is because a lot of the entrepreneurship, particularly entrepreneurship which leads to the creation of large companies, high impact companies, is in the technology sector. And uh, China, uh, in my view, uh, uh, absolutely uh, ill-thought logic, based on ill-thought logic. Uh, the Chinese government has made uh, the country basically inhospitable to a lot of foreign tech companies, with the idea that therefore we can grow Chinese technology champions, right? And which is absolutely, totally counterproductive. I mean, if I was the most patriotic Chinese, and I wanted to build China as the technology powerhouse of the world, I would make China wide open to the technology companies of the world, and I would protect intellectual property. Because when you do that, given the, uh, the, the strength of Chinese uh, science and engineering training, given the size of China's labor pool, that if, in fact, the country was wide open and it protected intellectual property, the IBMs and the Googles, they would do their leading edge R&D in China, right? And of course, 99% of the scientists working in those labs would be Chinese. And that's how Silicon Valley happened, you know, the Hewlett Packard and Fairchild Semiconductor and so on, right? Because slavery is no longer permitted. And so therefore, you know, people would, uh, you know, start working for IBM in China and then go do their own thing, right? And so, so what I find is that you take the the American or Euro European tech companies. They have a thousand R&D labs in China, they have a thousand R&D labs in India. The thousand R&D labs in China, I'm simplifying a little bit, but not too much. Basically are doing adaptation R&D, because that's better done close to the ground, but not the next generation R&D. The thousand R&D labs in India, because the Indian government says, we don't care who wins, in fact, IBM has a bigger market share of the Indian government's IT service business than the Indian companies. So the Indian government is completely agnostic. And the, 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 the Western tech companies, the R&D in India is the next generation R&D. And that's much more important in fostering tech entrepreneurship. So I think in terms of uh, the entrepreneurship and innovation scene, more money being spent in China, but higher productivity in India. Well, I think we are out of time, but I think you also just um, got a glimpse of um, what I believe will be Dr. Gupta's next <laughs> right. book, uh, looking at entrepreneurship around the world. So I wanted to touch on that topic. Um, but thank you all again for coming today, and I hope um, you found this as uh, entertaining and interesting as I did as well. So. Um, off to class, I guess. Mm -hmm.